Today's guest is Stacy Morgan, author of the brand new book, The Astronaut's Wife, How Launching My Husband Into Outer Space Changed the Way I Live on Earth. She's also an executive leadership coach for MOPS International. MOPS stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. And she has four children with her husband, Army Colonel and NASA astronaut, Drew Morgan. So Stacey, welcome to the Spouse Angle. I'm excited to get to know you today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Well, I know I gave a very Cliff Notes version of your bio and who you are, but I would love for you to expound on that a little bit, tell listeners about you and your background as a military spouse. And then I have a lot of questions specifically related to the astronaut's astronaut's wife piece of that today. So Sure, absolutely. So um, I met my husband when we were both cadets at West Point. So we kind of started our journey together, both of us in the military. I did not, I only did about two years um, and then I got out, but that was really the foundation of kind of how we started together. Um, then I went into the workforce while he went to medical school. So he is a, he is an army physician kind of by trade. Uh, and when he finished, um, his medical training. Then we moved to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and uh, we've been kind of in the special operations community uh, for pretty much all of our army time. Uh, Five years at Fort Bragg, then we moved to the DC area and worked with a few units there um, before one day he came home and said, uh, I'm so excited. NASA has opened up the window for um, applications for a new class of astronauts. And I was like, I don't understand why you're t- telling me this. I mean, like, why are you, you know, excited about that? Yeah, I mean, like, the 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 army is our life. It was it's our past, our present, and I assumed our future. We were supposed to be moving to Germany the next year, and I was really excited about that. Like, I had this fantasy of, uh, you know, traveling all over Europe and like eating pretzels and learning German and all these kind of fun things. And so I was like, I, what? Like, we have a plan. And uh, this plan feels really good considering how stressful, you know, our time, you know, at Bragg has been and in this job has been a lot of deployments, a lot of training trips. Um, like I could really, I really want this European, <laughs> this European thing to happen. And he said, well, don't worry. It's not going to happen. It's they, they had never selected an army physician before at that point. And so he was like, it's not going to happen, but um, I just want to try. And I was like, well, (laughs) I mean, okay. I mean, kind of had mixed feelings about it. I mean, I was like, hey, I wanted to be a ballerina when I was a kid. But at some point I left that dream behind. Like, I don't, like you've never, I felt like any interest he'd ever expressed in space stuff was like the same way when I was like, yeah, I also enjoyed watching Apollo 13. I didn't really think we were trying to, you know, um, steer any career choices there. But, and and he really wasn't. but because we, we love the army, we are still active duty army, we're still a military family. Um, but yeah, he put in his application, uh, kept making those gates, you know, as the pool got smaller, smaller, smaller. And then in 2013, you know, got the call uh, inviting him in to, uh, to NASA and the 21st class of astronauts. And so we picked up everything, you know, from the, the army track and put it on the NASA track. And that train took off. We had to unravel everything for Germany. We were literally supposed to put our car on the boat the next week. And I was like, Drew, we cannot put this car on the boat or like, if we're not there to meet the boat, we will never see this car again. (laughs) And so, uh, luckily with like, we kind of delayed the, the car delivery and the call came that week, but unraveling all of that, resubmitting all the PCS orders, all that stuff to move down here to Texas um, and and be part of a different kind of culture. There are a lot of uh, similarities to the military culture, but at the same time, it is very different. This is not a military community. Um, I'd never lived long-term in a non-military community before, so that was a little bit of an adjustment. Um, but, uh, but it's been great. And so we were here, we've been here since 2013. And then in two, uh, 2019, it was my husband's turn to go to space. As crazy as that sentence, that sentence sounds. And so uh, summer of 2019, uh, he launched to the International Space Station for a nine month mission uh, aboard the ISS. Wow. Well, I know it's a pet peeve for military spouses to have someone say, well, like you knew what you were getting into. And 
yes, to some degree you kind of do, but I think for you, like you really had no idea that you were going to be an astronaut's wife when you got married. No, no wasn't idea. your husband's career trajectory. No, not at all. I mean, so people always say like, oh, well, you know, what, what is it like to being married, you know, to be the astronaut's wife? Well, I'm like, well, he wasn't when I married him. You know, he's a soldier. He's a physician. He's like a soldier first. He always says that soldier first. And that's true. And, uh, and we kind of grew up together. I was 18 when I met him. And, uh, you know, the army is our, the military's lifestyle is our lifestyle. And uh, that's kind of where our foundation is in terms of like career path and kind of mindset. So it has been an adjustment, um, but it's, you know, it's been great. But uh, we're actually going back to do a two-year stint in the Army in 2013. Um, so we're coming back to it. We couldn't stay away. <laughs> in 2013? I'm uh, sorry, 2023. Sorry. Oh, I'm okay. the, using all <laughs> kinds of dates that don't make any sense. Sorry. 2023, we're going to go back and he's going to um, uh, command back in an Army unit. Because we just, I mean, we love the military. It is who we are. And um, after that, who knows? But, we, you know. It has been strange to be an active duty military family, but stay in the same place for close to a decade. That's, you know, that's yeah. super unusual. Yeah. So I want to kind of get into some of the differences. I know your husband deployed previously with special forces before becoming mm-hmm. astronaut, that's right. right? So how was the separation when he was in space different from the separations during those previous deployments? Yeah, there are a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences. Um, when he deployed, he deployed twice to Afghanistan, once to Iraq, several kind of shorter trips to different places. Um, I feel like uh, his, his time was a little bit more his own on those deployments. He kind of knew when I was, when I was available, our kids were younger then. So even though life was certainly stressful with toddlers and, you know, kindergartners or whatever, things were kind of simpler. I, looking back, I think like there was kind of like innocent times, you know, the biggest stress was like potty training a kid or like <laughs> they won't eat their dinner. Um, and, and I had a lot of more flexibility in my schedule because the kids weren't, you know, they were just little. And so he could call whenever he, when he wanted to, it wasn't terribly inconvenient when he would call from Afghanistan or whatever. Um, and it was certainly stressful, like any military deployment, but, um, you know, you weren't, experiencing those high risk moments live, which is one of the big differences from a, I would say a combat deployment to like a space deployment. So of course I would know when, when something's happening in a military deployment, you know, you know, because communication lines are shut down, you see something on the news, maybe they give you the heads up. You're not going to hear from them for, you know, days or, or weeks. And so, you know, something's up, but in contrast, the highest risk points for space exploration is launch, landing, and spacewalking, all of which are live streamed for the world to experience in real time with you. And so I, I don't think I fully appreciated how much extra stress that would add to those moments, knowing that if something goes wrong, that I will be experiencing it like with the world and I don't have, there will not be the privilege of kind of processing it and hearing about it privately first. Sure. It will be for the world to experience and kind of experience at the same time. And so that, that added a lot of stress um, to those moments, but a, a lot of similarities in terms of you got to get creative with the communication patterns. Um, I will say on, in, on orbit, he, he had a lot less uh, flexibility in his schedule the space station operates on Greenwich Mean Time, so about five or six hours ahead of here at Texas, and and their schedule all day is just jam packed, and it is scheduled for them. So he really could only call uh, right before he went to bed, which was the dreaded four to five p.m. window for me back here at home. And any mom knows, like that's the worst time of day because like yes. it's meal prep <laughs> and picking kids up, and like the world is just the wheels are coming off at that time of day. And that's when the phone would ring, and you can't exactly not take a call from space. So um, that was an adjustment too. Kind of like we were used to on deployments, you know, kind of. Um, being able to pace ourselves. He could have a big block of time to have a conversation. If I said, hey, this is not a good time. Can you call me later? He could call me later. You know, they go do something, they have dinner, they come back, he would call me again. That was not the case. In, when he was on orbit, it was like, this is the only window. That's it. It's this terrible time of day. Uh, take it or leave it. And, and that's it. And we would get one video chat um, a week 
And that was kind of similar to what you would do on a deployment, kind of using an iPad, kind of, they use some kind of program, but it's a lot like FaceTime or Skype. And, um, but one hour once a week and then kind of phone calls and you can email, like he could call me, I could not call him. We could email each other, but that time difference really did make a little bit of, uh, make things complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. So the subtitle of your book is How Launching My Husband into Outer Space Changed the Way I Live on Earth. So I want to hear more about that. How did it change the way that you live? Yeah, I think that the night, so he was on board for nine months. And certainly, you know, as a military spouse, I've done periods of single parenting before. Uh, but this was this was kind of like the varsity level experience where a lot of my other experience in the past, I felt like a little bit more were, were, were JV, you know, now my kids were older. So instead of having toddlers running around and worrying about potty training, I'm dealing with two teenagers and two tweens. And so you're dealing with hormones and puberty and relationships and GPAs and a lot of things that just are more complicated and more stressful and making those decisions on your own without someone to be able to kind of bounce things off of real time was more stressful. Um, but I really relied on a lot of these little lessons that I'd picked up over the years as a military spouse and then kind of had to put them into practice. So um, certainly I had faced, I think fear is a real, a real issue, you know, for, for a lot of people, but especially military spouses and people whose, whose spouses have high, what we would consider high risk jobs, you know, like police officers, firemen, um, you know, and um, I, I I learned this lesson a long time ago. I remember on my husband's first deployment, the kind of unspoken rule was like, don't talk about how scary it is that mm -hmm. they could be killed. And uh, because, the, the, the you know, the war on terror was going hot and heavy. People were getting injured or killed all the time. We'd gone to several memorial services and everyone in my community, all of our husbands were deployed together. Uh, overseas. And there was this kind of unspoken rule, like, listen, it's scary enough <laughs> turning on the news and seeing what's going on. We don't need, let's not talk about it. Like if we talk about it, that makes it feel more possible, I guess. And I was talking to my friend one day and we were sitting on her front porch and she's very wise. And she had experienced an, like, this was kind of my first real deployment experience. She had done it before. And she said, we were just randomly sipping our coffee. And she said, you know, I've been thinking about what would happen um, if our husbands were killed. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like, this is like, we're not supposed to do that. Like, we're just supposed to sit in ignorant bliss and kind of like try to pretend like it's not happening. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, I've been thinking about it and I've decided that, you know, I kind of like have followed that thought path all the way to towards it, to the end. And here's the deal. It would be really hard. I'm not saying it wouldn't be like, a whole new way of doing life. And we would probably need some counseling and, you know, not that it wouldn't be sad, but things, life would still go on. There would still be good things. Like God would bring people to us and, and, and support us and comfort us with, and, and it would be okay. The sun would still rise and set every day. And that was shocking to me to hear her, like to see a real person, a friend who I respect so much, turn and look this fear straight in the eye while the rest of us had been kind of like just trying to avert our eyes and pretend like it wasn't there. And she was so brave to look at it and follow the thought path all the way to the end. And the conclusion was actually, if you do that, like it's not quite as scary, it kind of take some of the power of that fear away. And so that was a little taste of it. And then I kind of got to practice it, um, you know, over and over each time we deployed. And then I felt like those were all practice runs for when it really came to a head at the rocket launch. So um, my husband launched on a Soyuz rocket. And so we had to travel all the way to Kazakhstan to watch the rocket launch. And so we're standing in this field. It's dark. Um, there's no big countdown clock. There's no big announcers. It feels very it kind of surreal just to be standing at there. It feels like a, almost like a movie set. And um, we can see the rocket only a mile away. And I, you know that in 10 seconds, either it's going to be the, the most amazing and like wonderful and proud moment of your life, or you're going to be a widow. One, like there's kind of no middle ground mm -hmm. and you're not really sure which way it's going to go. And I felt like, man, all those little practice runs of like facing these fears head on prepared me for this moment because it's terrifying to face this 
and, and that's one of the big differences, you know, between a, a space deployment and a combat deployment is like, yeah, you may be a widow, but you're not going to see it happen in real time right in front of your eyes, probably. It's and so to face it like, oh, this is going to happen right here. Um, and I'm going to I'm holding my kids hands and I'm and the world is watching and I'm not sure which way it's going to go. Um, it forces you to face that fear and decide what am I going to do with this fear? Am I going to let it dictate my life? Am I going to live in this fearful space? Or am I going to choose an alternative where the foundation of my life is not dependent on whether or not my husband lives in this, like in 10 seconds. And most of us don't have the opportunity to kind of stand in that crossroads. It was terrifying and overwhelming, but also an incredible opportunity because I felt like I have a choice and I choose to not live fearfully um, and instead choose this hope, you know, like for me, my faith in God and feeling like God is offering me an alternative of, of way of living, an alternative foundation to build my life on. And this foundation is not dependent on whether this rocket launch is successful or he comes home from a combat deployment or something happens with our finances or our health or, or any number of other things that can be so overwhelmingly scary. It's, de- it's, it's not relying on any of those things. It's, it's different. It's, it's relying on something that is unchanging. And that's kind of a game changer. Like in my book, I write about it in chapter one, because all the other lessons are kind of built off that and, and lessons about finding quality friends and putting yourself out there and being vulnerable over and over again, and uh, not being afraid to ask for help and, and then receive that help graciously when people offer it as hard as that can be and not getting stuck in survival mode and still having fun. Um, and, and being creative with communication, you know, all these little lessons, but you can't do any of those things if you're living in, in a constant state of fear and dread that something terrible might happen and that the world would end if that biggest fear came true. Mm-hmm. Well, you've just given a lot of great thoughts and advice there, but I did also want to ask you, like, based on your experiences, what pieces of maybe practical advice would you give to fellow military spouses who are navigating a deployment or a separation of some kind? You know, maybe it's not in space, but we (laughs) have, you know, the situation with Ukraine is causing a lot of stress and a lot of separations right now. So just was curious if you had any like last words, last pieces of advice for military spouses listening. Yeah, I would say, you know, in the military, there's always going to be that person who whispers into your ear, like, um, you know, don't get involved over there. There's like too much drama or like, oh, there's like a weird, you know, like officer enlisted dynamic. You don't want to be involved in that or whatever. And they're going to encourage you to pull back and not get involved. And that is the worst advice I think you can get. Like, um, my husband tells everybody who asks him about his career path that like he is a product of everything the military has offered and he has always he has volunteered for the coolest things and it has taken him where he is today. And as a spouse, I think the same advice is true. Like get involved, say yes. You don't have to lead these things. It doesn't have to like take over your life, but like don't isolate yourself. There are going to be people who will try to make you angry or resentful or, um, or feel like your life is terrible. But the reality is that's, that's not really true. And you need to surround yourself with people who see the world as it really is, which is actually full of opportunities, um, who want to support you. Um, so when you're invited to those, you know, those family readiness group meetings, like go when you're offered, um, free childcare on maybe because your spouse is to like, use it, use the library, shop at the commissary, go to the PX, like all the things get involved with what's happening in the military community, because these are your people. And don't let anybody tell you that like you don't want to get involved with them because they you're always going to meet some people that you don't want to hang out with. But the but the reality is 95 percent of them are really cool people, really kind people. And and they know what you're going through in a way that your high school friends will never understand and your parents will never understand. Right. Like these are people who are in the thick of it with you. And so jump in with both feet like it's going to involve, you know, a little humility, be, be a willingness to be vulnerable, to say, I'm lonely. Um, you know, like when our husbands deploy, we lose our companions. You lose your sounding board. You lose another adult in the house to like help you with life. And so it's okay to say, 
this sucks. Like this is a hard season. Doesn't mean you can be hard and also have good things in it. it does not, it's not one or the other. Your life should not like how good your life is, is not dependent on whether or not your husband is home with you. That's like a good thing, but it's not, that's not the foundation that your life is built on. But in order to, you know, stay connected, you've got to get out there. You've got to introduce yourself and show up at events and go to the playground and say hi to the other moms and all the things like, don't, don't brush that off as something you don't want to be involved in. I've seen what happens when people do that and then bad things happen because, you know, it, I get it. Ignorance feels like bliss until something bad happens. And then you are so sad that you didn't get involved. Like you dig your hole that you just can't get out of. So get plugged in, find your friends, be vulnerable, admit that you're, it's okay to say you're lonely or sad or whatever, show up and do for others what you would want them to do for you. And, and, and the reality is that in times of hardship, like deployment, it's going to be a very meaningful time for your spouse. Like deployments are, are touch points in their lives forever. And there's going to be it, it, both good and bad. And it can be the same for you. Your life does not pause because your spouse is deployed. The deployment times were certainly, they're always full of challenges, but looking back, times of deployment were some of the richest friendship times I've ever had because we bonded together over that shared hardship and that season. So look for that, invest in that, find those friends, and it, it can actually be a really cool season of your life, even though it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice, Stacey. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Well, uh, I'll just say that um, I am donating all the proceeds for the book sales of my book to charities that um, support military families. <laughs> so wow. um, I am unashamedly <laughs> promoting the book because I'm not keeping any of the money. And I love that I'm pouring it back into the community that I love the most, which is military families. And so uh, The Astronaut's Wife, available wherever you buy books. If you love it, you can buy 10 copies. If you don't, you know, whatever, the money's donated to military charity, so it benefits you in the end anyway. That's amazing. Stacey, thanks so much for sharing your personal story and that advice for military families. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on this Fast Angle. Thanks so much. Thanks.